Okay, good, good morning, everyone. Can, can I invite everyone to come around the table close to a mic? Because this is going to be an interactive session. It's, 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 it's not a formal structure. Uh, so we, we, we really want to get the input of the participants. So we'll just give it a minute or so for people to come in, but please just sit on the table close to a microphone and let's engage on dialogue. And, and to our new colleagues that are coming, can, can, can we sit around the table? We, 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 we want everybody sitting close to a mic. We would like to get everybody's input if possible. I see a few defectors in the corners. We, we, we also have room around here, although it's harder to escape from this side of the room. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, attending this closing session on the digital inclusion track. My name is uh, Susan Chalmers, and together with Paul and a number of other MEG members, we've organized this session as a way for um, folks to come together and discuss any insights, um, share experiences that they've had over the week, um, please feel free to be liberal in your comments. It looks like we kind of have a, a, smaller, a smaller group, more intimate group, so we can, um, we can just share. Um, for those of you who uh, were unable to attend the introductory uh, track or session that we had on Tuesday, what we did is we went out into five different breakout groups on some of the sub-themes uh, of digital inclusion. And if I recall correctly, those breakout groups were governance, um, local content and multilingualism, access, um, affordability and infrastructure, social inclusion, and somebody's gonna help me with the fifth one. Oh, sorry, skills, education, and jobs. Um, so we're not necessarily going to follow that format, um, but we're just going to use this time to, to have a discussion about the inclusion issues that folks have um, experienced over the week. So we could either go around the table uh, or just ask for volunteers to begin. Sure. I just, want, I just want to add to that as well. You know, the, the IGF is a personal journey. You know, we, there, there's so much going on. We, we have different interests, uh, but we also share common interests. And those that uh, followed some of the digital inclusion track, the, the, these are issues that are quite pertinent. And for us, you know, the feeling is, you know, we, we've got to tackle a lot of big problems to achieve true digital inclusion. And the sort of feedback we want is, you know, have these workshops helped us to achieve some of those goals? Has it fallen short? Are there areas that uh, need more intervention? Do we have workshops that are saying the same thing? You know, so are, are, we, are we getting duplication? Uh, we, we also want to try and draw out some of the key messages because this is one of the outputs of the IGF are the messages and these get captured into other documents and they, they help to set policy on, 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 on the global level. So, as Susan said, you know, this session is a reflective session. It's, it's just to get a sense of how was your journey, you know, the, the, there's no formal right response. It, it's really, how, how did you feel? Was it good? You know, most of us are 
on this side are members of the MAG, so we're part of the organization group for the IGF. So it's important for us because next year we're, st we're starting preparations for the next one, which is in Poland. And of course the intent is, is not to go backwards, to go forwards. You know, we don't want to repeat things that don't work. And we, we, we have been accused, or the IGF has been accused in the past of you know, not being reflective of the issues and concerns of, of the different stakeholders. So, you know, but we are human and we do make mistakes. But tell us, you know, but it's not just about telling us about what we did right or wrong. You know, how was your experience? What did you learn? What were your key takeaways? If there's one thing you need to take back to your own constituency, your own government, what would that be? You know, is there a new message or something that you've learned or something that's been amplified through the conversations and discussions that have happened? So we're hoping to get participation from everybody here. Um, so don't, don't be afraid. Uh, jump on the mic if you can, please. Thank you. So would anybody like to start us off? I know it's, well, it's not that early anymore, but. <laughs> we, have to, we have to pick a corner. Yeah, we'll, we'll have, we'll, we'll call, upon, call upon one of our MEG members to help start the discussion. Maybe we start with our colleagues on the MEG and work around Okay. That. June, would you like to start us off? Hi, I'm June Paris. I'm on the MAG. Um, this is my second year, and I've got one more year to go. Um, my, the part that I um, looked at in the last session here was um, govern uh, governance. And I think now, since I've done that, I'm a little bit confused myself with governance, even though I've studied governance. And <laughs> I think that it's not entirely clear for all of us that are here. Um, um, because I got the impression that some people think internet governance is governed by the government. And I want to know if we can talk about that. Uh, I'm just starting you off because it's not really, is it? Even countries without a government, they can have internet governance. So it's not the same thing. And since doing the last session, I myself, I'm not even clear on it anymore. Um, so if, some, if we can talk about that to begin with and see if you can clear my head for next year. Um, but as I said, there's countries without a government, like, um, it was it, what country was it? Um, it? Was it, it begins with an I. Libya, that's it, L. Libya, Libya hasn't got a government and Libya is doing, having internet governance and they seem to be doing quite well at it. So you don't really need a government to do have internet governance, okay? So I just want to clear that up and I want people to talk about it right now, if they can. Thank you, I, thank you, June. I think that's, that's a fascinating question and if I recall from our introductory session, um, you'll have to forgive me, the gentleman in the blue plaid shirt, you had organized a session about um, digital inclusion and governance or inclusive stakeholder um, practices within um, ICANN, I believe it was. Would you be willing to uh, share um, any key messages or insights from that session? That'd be a good place to start, I think, on the governance track. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it, it was great to have the opportunity to have the session. Let me say that first of all. It was really great to have the IGF. Um, because my impression was, we, we touched on some pretty sensitive issues in the, about structural inequality in multi-stakeholder governance at ICANN. Uh, and we talked directly about questions of gender inequality, age inequality, race inequality, language inequality, geographical inequalities, business strength in, in, in internet governance and so on. Um, but it was done, I mean, Paul, you were there. Uh, my feeling of the session was that it was very open, it was very reflective, it was very frank, it was very direct. And I thought this is such a good f place, the Internet Governance Forum, as a place to bring all these different stakeholders together and to be able to have a serious, serious discussion about serious issues without getting you know, super passionate or unconstructive and so on. So it was, it was very good, it was very good. Thank you so much. And is, while we're on the topic of inclusive internet governance practices, would anybody else like to um, share any 
insights that they have or have encountered over the past week? If not, maybe we can move on to something um, along the lines of um, access, access to infrastructure um, and inclusion, digital inclusion of um, folks and access to the internet. Would anybody buddy, like to kick us off? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, my name is Mirwais. Uh, I work with Ministry of Communication and IT as a plan policy director, and that's Afghanistan. Uh, so, uh, of course, the whole uh, week have been uh, so much uh, new experience for me, and uh, I saw that there have been different sessions talking about how uh, what policy makers and regulators should do back in the country and what they shouldn't touch and what should be prioritized. Uh, coming back to the uh, topic of uh, digital inclusion, so of course uh, we currently are struggling in terms of uh, reaching out uh, internet and broadband throughout the country. Uh, but the practices that, that yesterday at the same hall we had a session where uh, the broadbandpolicy.org a, 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 web, a website is uh, developed where uh, government can see uh, what is the world doing in terms of broadband policy and what uh, should be included in while drafting those policy and what are the good experience and what have uh, other countries do. So those sort of platform knowledge sharing and best practices could help countries that are currently struggling. Uh, so one of the questions was, right, uh, okay, so you, you are making sure that you, you are, uh, uh, internet is accessible. So then what's the next step? And uh, how will, uh, what needs to be done in the area of digital literacy? And what standards should be considered in digital literacy uh, that could uh, uh, best suit the, the need? And how uh, do you encourage people to start using those infrastructure that you are investing so much. Uh, so uh, this opens up a new window for discussion back in our country and see and adopt new approaches. And uh, you have to have those uh, different indicators and mi milestones. So once you achieve the other, have to, you have to be ready and you have to uh, make the environment unable for that. So those sort of discussion uh, in terms of policy and, where, and, and the most important thing is how do you make sustainable those uh, sort of mechanisms in terms of digital inclusion and, and specifically talking about digitalization. Uh, so those sort of uh, topics, uh, knowledge sharing, idea sharing, best practices being shared. So I think this platform have uh, helped personally, helped me in seeing things from a uh, different perspective and thank you for that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, does, does anybody else here work on broadband access in the room? Because I'd be interested to hear um, <clears throat> reflections on this comment. No? Yeah. Now, what, what, one of the things that is shaping up in my mind, and you know, I'm, I'm from the Global South. I, I live in Namibia, but I engage with regulators across the continent is we still have a 20th century mentality when we think, you know, we think in telecommunications. We have a Ministry of uh, Information, Communication, and Technology. We have communication policies, you know, but the Global North has moved to digital policies and not telecommunication policies and things. And I think this is a radical shift that we, we need to start thinking about in the Global South. And it's not that we're not aware of it, we're just slow to do it, but when you look at a digital policy, you, know, you, you start looking at digital literacy. It's not just about connecting a community anymore, it's about providing meaningful connectivity, having a digital literate uh, community, people that can access it, and also understanding the difference between access and accessibility, uh, which I'm still trying to understand myself, <laughs> and I get taken to tasks many times because I don't fully understand it, but we need to understand that because access and accessibility are two completely different things. So I, I, I don't know if anyone around the floor has, has, has any comments you know, on, on, on how they feel we can move towards a more digitally driven uh, policy framework or sensitivity around our governments understanding that process.
Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the record, this is Mohammad Shabbi Rawan from Pakistan, and uh, I am the president of Internet Society Accessibility Special Interest Group. Uh, well, uh, my friend was talking about the difference between access and accessibility. To my uh, limited understanding, uh, these are the terms which are uh, being used interchangeably for access over the internet and access to the internet. Uh, but as a person with disability, I, I have a uh, concern to, to both. Uh, for instance, uh, there is an access to the internet where you need to connect uh, with, the, with a person to the internet where they don't have the access to the internet and digital technologies. Uh, at the same time, there is a situation and there, there comes a situation where uh, a person has access to digital technology, access to the internet, but still remains unable to use or to take benefit of that technology or that internet just because the technology was not uh, developed in such a way so that everyone could use it. So the, the part of inclusivity was somehow ignored in that. Uh, to that, I call the accessibility on the internet where person with disabilities have the access to the internet and and remain unable to use it. And then there is uh, also a part where people do not even have the access to the to the technology, much less to talk about inclusivity and it, its development. Uh, and in, in that, there are uh, both haves and have-nots. Uh, if you allow me a bit, uh, a bit of more time. So uh, halves uh, is the, is the uh, north and south divide. One is the, of course, the cost uh, element which comes uh, from living in the, in the global south where uh, there are less resources and, and people uh, try to do uh, or to, to, to uh, achieve certain things using shortcuts. Uh, and they try. They mostly avoid standards. Well, I I am not saying that we should strictly follow the standards because uh, uh, being uh, humans, following those standards or developing those standards, there may be some lackings. But there needs to be some sort of standards which we need to follow so that they can give us. Uh, if we are we are not understanding the technology and the requirement, they can give us some guidelines. Uh, second thing that I wanted to highlight was uh, regarded to uh, related to the inclusivity in policy. Uh, one example that I can give from my country, Pakistan, is that last year we uh, so so that was the example that I gave uh, earlier in a couple of sessions as well. Uh, but still, to reiterate uh, that in 2017 and 2018, government of Pakistan uh, formulated its IT policy. Uh, it invited inputs from uh, different uh, sectors, uh, multi-stakeholder model, uh, Ministry of Information Technology uh, was consulting different people, different communities, technical communities, academia. Uh, of course, there was government involved. Of course, there were human rights organizations involved. In that, there were persons with disabilities also included. So the government has uh, now a complete document which is approved by the by the uh, government of Pakistan, and it is uh, following. And now it's 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 creating a strategy. So in this way, at least it the government tried to include all sections of the society to in uh, to get their inputs that what do they want if you don't ask uh, people that what do people want and and government start or people start thinking that they are all knowing and they can the X, Y, or Z kind of uh, provisions can be provided, and A, B, C provisions cannot be provided without asking and assuming uh, this could uh, lead us astray. Uh, this is my sort of input. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for that. Um, and for wait, before you put the microphone back, ma'am, I think I want to ask a few follow-up questions uh, because there is so much in in Mohammed and your intervention. Um, thank you for sharing the uh, kind of the landscape of uh, the policy landscape in Pakistan. And um, I'm just wondering, are there any other um, leaders, and are there any countries that stand out in particular who are champions that 
that you know of or any um, companies in particular that have seemed to prioritize um, accessibility in this regard? Uh, so, uh, to my uh, limited understanding, so here I have to uh, to acknowledge my limited, my own limited knowledge and understanding. But I know uh, in in developed countries, for instance, there is uh, the standards BS double seven double eight of uh, United Kingdom. Uh, they follow the uh, WC uh, web uh, W3Cs WCAG guidelines, and they have made their own standards of making the websites accessible. And they have their own standards that at what level the websites and the digital technology should be accessible. Uh, similarly, there is uh, in the in the US there is Section 508. Uh, which which is uh, uh, related to accessible technology and its its accessibility, and and I know that there were inputs when these standards and policies were being developed. There were inputs uh, which were uh, which were uh, included uh, from the persons uh, with disabilities and their their communities. Uh, I am not sure, and I have not been able to verify uh, from right from uh, the community or uh, or able to hear from the person with disabilities but i heard that uh, at least on the paper the the government in afghanistan also developed uh, an it policy and there were some sections on uh, uh, that that addressed the inclusivity and also about the about the issues of person with disabilities but to what extent and to whom the government consulted while they were formulating the policy uh, that that i need to uh, yet more make myself more aware so uh, this is it thank you um so there there is a lot of information in there and um, i believe there is if i'm not mistaken i'm pretty sure there is a dynamic coalition um, on accessibility and dealing with these issues so um, if folks are interested in um, following this issue uh, throughout and within the IGF community, it may be worth checking that, that DC out. Um, while we're on this topic, is there anything else, um, and would anybody else like to contribute to um, the sub-theme of accessibility and inclusion? Oh, oh yes, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amelia Kamanalangi. I'm from a Pacifica Nexus think tank. I just wanted to say that uh, it has, has been a pleasure being here at the IGF, all the, uh, meeting all the vast stakeholders with different disciplines and to tap into that. Um, just from my personal experience, because uh, I'm an I information system person, and later on, when I first started, whenever I tried to, to, do, to voice my opinion on the inclusivity on the social side uh, in relation to ICT, it was always shut down by the ISPs and, and in that environment. So I'm just glad to be here to see that, even though uh, that we started talking about it, and then I could see the ripple effect of this, that there is actually inclusivity. Because now in the Pacific, there is women in ICT being driven, and also in women economic empowerment, acknowledging the use of technology, uh, connecting the, uh, the rural to the urban for those who have access already. So I'm just glad that we are here in this room talking about this issue because there is a ripple effect. It's happening. So thank you for, for being here and talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, so, social inclusion is, is, is a very important topic and uh, it, it really forms part of uh, being digitally included. Do we have Judy? Oh, June. Judy. Oh, Judy. Judy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you, Susan. Um, uh, just to add on to the voice um, uh, regarding accessibility and access, I, I think there was um, one of the panels that they were talking about access and uh, when this um, 
other panelists brought in um, the accessibility regarding persons with disability, then you could see that everyone got confused because when they were addressing access, they meant, um, you know, is there internet in that place? But just as uh, uh, Mohammed has said, accessibility is actually that there is internet, but there is a particular person that are not able to access to it, uh, probably because of a software, probably because of a hardware. And so that is important to know. Um, I know that in Kenya, sorry, my name is Judy, I come from Kenya. <laughs> Yes, in Kenya, in the ICT law, we actually um, have a caption. Let me just say it's a caption that says um, we should be following the WC3 um, standard when it comes to the web content. And unfortunately, you will find that even um, the government websites are not accessible, like um, a screen reader cannot be able to, to read through it. So... Um, I'm, I'm not sure how to turn, you know, the policy into implementation because yes, it is there, but how is it going to be implemented? How do we go forward on that? Thank you. Thank you, Judy, and I think there are probably <clears throat> a number of different approaches um, that have been used for implementation, though I'll have to admit it's not my area, but if, um, if folks do have experience, um, it would be very interesting to hear some illustrations. And just with regard to what you had said about kind of clarifying the terminology, access to the internet, and then accessibility, um, I think uh, Mohammed put it very um, clearly when it was access to the internet and access on the internet. Um, so I, I think that might be an important yeah. distinction. Um, and just in the way of, of kind of the boring organizational background. When um, the, the MEG members here, when we were um, discussing um, the different sub-themes within digital inclusion, there, uh, there was um, some thinking about, um, so organizing around infrastructure. Uh, so you start there, and so I would consider some infrastructural issues like broadband accessibility, um, even IPv6 as an infrastructural issue, and then you have the content layer and then um, some, some other aspects of that. So that, it, it might be helpful, we were kind of thinking of it in terms of the OSI model um, um, for organizing sub-themes. Do we have any other thoughts? Um, yes, Mohammed, please. So uh, while we are on the topic of accessibility, uh, one of the sessions that uh, I, I was on the panel uh, the day before yesterday uh, uh, of new participatory method, there a very one of very interesting points came up. And while we are on the suggestions that what we need to do about is, uh, the, the question was that do we have uh, our research in quantitative terms? about the accessibility of the internet for person with disabilities, that how, uh, if a website is made accessible uh, to, to certain level, how much it, it benefits the community and what is the, uh, what is the outcome in, in the monetary terms or in the financial terms. Uh, one of the answers uh, there was that there were uh, very uh, short or lacking of such kind of data and such kind of researches. So while uh, I, would, I would highly recommend that this, uh, if, if we are doing some research and that we are trying to commit to, to some research in the future, this is one area where uh, we need to work upon that of how in terms of quantitative terms, in terms of, in terms of financial terms, the accessibility impacts uh, the websites and the uh, uh, so so if i put it in in another way that uh, how the accessible websites uh, impact the financial or revenues of the company and how the inaccessible website impact the uh, financial uh, benefits and the revenues of the companies and organizations thank, thank you mohammed are, are there any other interventions comments I, th I, th I think we have a sort of 
uh, Jeff message, I think, uh, you know, I capture something here that, uh, you know, we need to differentiate and understand what access and accessibility means and capture this in policy dialogue if we are to achieve digital inclusion. So that's possibly one of the IGF messages we can take back and share. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to hand the floor quickly to Dalsi just to give a bit of an insight into the access affordability because we're on this theme and in infrastructure to see if we can stimulate some dialogue around that, for some further dialogue. But as, as I mentioned, Joe, we really want to get, we don't want to be talking to ourselves. <laughs> we, we, we get a lot of opportunity to talk to ourselves, but we, we don't get a lot of opportunity to talk to you. Okay, yes, please. Hi there, this is Carolina from LACNIC. Um, so Ron, I understand that then you're trying to start off with maybe the infrastructure layer and speak a bit more of access to the internet. There's been several um, sessions around uh, community connectivity and I think that definitely needs to come up as a message. Um, I feel that what's sort of coming out more strongly is all the work around community networks, uh, movements, uh, across the uh, Global South, and I think we have a few representatives, at least there's one here, a colleague um, uh, from a community network uh, in Latin America, and I think um, sort of the message there, or you know, what's been discussed in the sessions is sort of like the evolution, and um, back saying, I don't know, IGF 2016, community networks, you know, felt like it was like a, you know, sort of a new topic, a new thing, and it's a movement that's gained out sort of a lot of strength, uh, throughout the years, um, and essentially it's this idea of, 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 you know, when we think about connectivity, connecting the unconnected, that we don't just think about, hey, you know, private, uh, you know, private sector has to do it, or governments have to do it, there's sort of other answers uh, to connectivity and, and community networks are, um, you know, if I may attempt to sort of define them, um, uh, networks that are built and sort of run by communities that are um, unconnected, you know, be it because they're in rural areas or because in the global south they're in, in I don't know, say, urban areas that are regarded as unsafe and, and therefore internet service providers don't want to go in there to provide the service. Um, so, in term, yeah, again, in terms of access, I think that's the message that needs to, you know, come across. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I don't know if if uh, perhaps there's an example or an illustration of a community network or a narrative that maybe our colleague could. Okay. Sorry, um, so um, here's a colleague from uh, Colombia and uh, he doesn't feel so comfortable with the Spanish, so he's uh, just given me a few, a few ideas. There's a lot of examples, actually, of community networks. And, um, you know, I can give the, so I'm, again, with LACNIC, uh, I run the Frida program, um, and um, we gave a community networks award to our colleagues from uh, Nuestra Red in Colombia, uh, who, I, uh, this is Freddy Rivera. Um, and uh, essentially they have um, uh, sort of brought connectivity to rural Colombia again uh, to an area that was uh, disconnected and you know I can provide sort of details maybe about the size of the network, how it's built, uh, I don't know if that's you know particularly relevant but there's actually several exam examples from Latin America, Southeast Asia, um, Africa, um, you know I would say from the early 2000s to date um, that uh, have you know proven successful, relying on a sort of whole range of different technologies. Really, um, I, I don't know you know if that that you know that's kind of what you're looking for. Uh, I mean, it's um, I don't know such a sort of wealth of you know uh, sort of. Um, approaches that these different communities have adopted um, that it's sort of hard to you know give one concrete example um, and just to sort of relay what my colleague here was saying is that he was saying sort of trying to tie the question of access to accessibility saying that community networks is such an effort to sort of build infrastructure build the networks that sometimes they struggle um, to also meet standards for accessibility uh, he asked me to relay that to, to the public so yeah just on the topic of community networks, and maybe I'm going to throw some questions back to you. I, I work on the African continent and I engage with a lot of regulators. I do TFY space, so we're in a regulated part of the spectrum, uh, which, which needs, anyway, that's, that's a different topic. But there is a definite disconnect between the regulators and community networks. 
And I've spoken to regulators and the regulators say, you know, we need to understand from the community networks what they want, you know, that sort of attitude. But the community networks are not getting the spectrum that they need. There's complex processes for them to get the license. Uh, and that doesn't enable the community networks to thrive. And in my opinion, I believe the community networks will play a massive role in connecting the currently disconnected. And then there's the requirement that uh, the community networks need to put down their business models, which have to be sustainable, and they've got to have this management structure and all this sort of other complex stuff that they apply to the larger ISPs and the MNOs. So if, if, if we were going to take a message to the regulators, what would that message be? Well, I, I wish there were um, um, more colleagues from the community networks uh, here. I don't know if there's anyone because uh, that'd be really helpful. I think they have, uh, you know, multiple messages that are very sort of polished. Um, so it's a pity they didn't make it here. But I think um, sort of trying to go to sort of the, the big themes, um, what we've, you know, been discussing in the last couple of days is that when community networks started, they were, you know, it was an idea, right? They were in past proof of concept, if you will, right? And and now we know there, are, uh, you know, multiple communities uh, again relying on different technologies, with, you know, facing different challenges across the global south that work, right? Um, so in terms of thinking how community networks can scale, uh, there's sort of several questions that lie ahead, um, and I think you got to the heart of two. One is uh, working on on sort of the regulatory front to ensure that networks are not operating in informality, right? So that they're not like, you know, trying to borrow a spectrum and doing everything like, you know, sort of off the books. And there's actually been quite a bit of progress. And again, I'm from Latin America, so I can speak to that. Um, we have one of the community networks we supported back in 2015 called Alta Mundi, and they received an operator's license uh, in Argentina. So there, there has been, uh, sort of uh, conquers, if you will, or steps forward, um, you know, uh, on the sort of regulation front. Uh, and of course, I mean, within the community networks movements, there's a lot of things that need to still sort of be worked out. As you mentioned, there's a the question of sustainability models. Um, you know, some communities work uh, based on sort of non-market, a uh, non-market logic, and that works for some community networks, it doesn't for others. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, the various models is something that's been explored. They're also uh, sort of exploring uh, questions around producing uh, local content. Um, there's a lot more to do still on sort of the development of hardware and software that's um, uh, sort of better suited for the needs of community networks. Um, but, but definitely, I mean, if I were to summarize, I mean, the community networks are still figuring things out and, and one of the sort of key things that are seen as, you know, an important and necessary next step is working more closely with regulators on questions around, uh, you know, spectrum use and access. Um, and, you know, all their sort of complementary aspects, as I mentioned before, for instance, um, uh, you know, being granted operators uh, licenses so that they can access, you know, universal service funds and so forth. Um, and I hope I do, I did justice to, uh, I don't know, again, if there's anyone else from, from here that wants to talk about it, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Freddy will speak in Spanish and then I will translate in, uh, in English, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, Dos aspectos muy importantes que, que me llaman la atención eh, es, primero, el tema de regulación del espectro. Eh, Nels. Um, well, two aspects that are really important that I would like to mention uh, about uh, spectrum policies. Es el gran agujero negro que tenemos las redes comunitarias para poder cumplir nuestra misión de conectarnos. For us, it's like a big uh, black hole uh, that we have to, to face uh, and uh, to, come, to, to come by with to really connect us. In Colombia, for example, we have just estrenar a ley of technologies that we have demanded from the hemos demandado because they don't give us access justo a este spectrum. There's a new uh, law um, defining technologies and access to spectrum in Colombia and uh, we from the community networks, we uh, are now on trial with the government because we consider this, uh, that this law doesn't give us uh, the rights that we need to the spectrum. 
y al contrario nos deja al nivel de simples eh, beneficiarios de las políticas del Estado, lo que contradice el espíritu de las redes comunitarias. And so we always have to wait that the, the state somehow is beneficent uh, to our demands without uh, really granting us uh, rights. Queremos recalcar que lo importante de las redes comunitarias es precisamente la gobernanza en que nosotros podamos gobernar estas redes. For us, the aspect of governance is really uh, important, and we, as community networks, we want to govern our own networks. Bien. Eh, también creo que eh, en el segundo punto hay una, eh, han manifestado ustedes una confusión entre acceso y accesibilidad, eh, la cual para mí no es tan confusa y quiero expresarme al respecto. And it seems that there's still kind of a, a confusion between access and accessibility. I don't uh, see much of confusion here and I will tell you why. Nosotros las redes comunitarias solucionamos el problema de acceso a la red. Sin embargo, para nosotros es sumamente costoso en esfuerzo, tiempo y dinero volver nuestras redes comunitarias accesibles, como por ejemplo para las personas con discapacidad. What we can do as community networks is this first step to create access uh, for the communities, but uh, the real task uh, comes later when we are talking about how to make uh, uh, this first uh, access uh, to turn it into really an accessibility for the whole community. Pero la accesibilidad no es un problema solo para las personas con discapacidad. En el caso de nuestras regiones, eh, o en Colombia en particular, la accesibilidad es un problema también de alfabetismo. And when we talk about accessibility, we uh, don't only talk here about uh, people with different capacities, uh, uh, or uh, we are talking here, um, thank you. Uh, 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 we're talking here about, about uh, literacy and uh, digital skills. It's, uh, tenemos redes que cubren el acceso para grandes poblaciones de campesinos, pero son campesinos que, por ejemplo, no pueden leer, no saben leer o tener acceso eh, interpretativo de los conceptos. Uh, for instance, there are uh, networks that we uh, have uh, deployed uh, in rural areas where lots of uh, farmers are living, but uh, those people uh, very often do not know uh, how to read or uh, they don't have the skills to interpret uh, uh, certain messages. Hemos discutido sobre la accesibilidad como también sobre la gobernanza de Internet, pero creo que la próxima pregunta en un evento como estos debe ser la red para qué. So we are now in this panel about the question of the accessibility uh, to, the, to the networks, but uh, we should maybe uh, broaden uh, uh, the question to the point, uh, what do we uh, use the, the Internet for? Sales. Thanks. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank our speaker. And I've actually formed what could be a message here out of what you've just said, but I just want to share it for, for the thoughts. The, the, one of the reasons I'm trying to capture this is I have to do a speech in the closing <laughs> as a wrap-up. So I'm start, trying to steal your ideas. So thank you. But for a community network, the first step is to create access, but the real task comes later to turn access into accessibility. Is that a capture of that? For a community network, the first step is to create access. But the real task comes later to turn access into accessibility. Yeah, I think that captures uh, the spirit of it. I think uh, it would be important maybe to also state the part about having to work on regulation instead of a next step. Yes. Yeah, that, that'd yep. be... Yeah. Right. I actually have the regulations captured elsewhere because that's something I experience a lot of. Right, okay. So I have captured that. Okay, wonderful. But I, I think this does, just, just two seconds because we need to move on, but I think it raises an important issue that our regulators do not understand is community networks are not ISPs. They, they need connectivity to deliver their core mandate. 
and there isn't connectivity, so they have to establish that first to deliver what they want, which could be a service, it, it, it could be e-medicine, it could be something else, you know, just get in the community as part of the digital uh, village. Yeah, they they meant to be. They are meant to be complementary to you know the you know big sort of service providers. Some of them may define themselves as uh, as ISPs, uh, small ISPs. I don't want to say that those are two sort of separate terms, but I think the spirit is um, there's this term that they've used of you know sort of coexisting, if you will, and you know they can peacefully coexist and serve to connect the unconnected. I think I'm happy to talk more about that at the end of the session if you need to. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh yep, yeah, we'll come back. Uh, yeah, just to add, I think what a point that was also um, uh, mentioned is that if you talk about uh, uh, accessibility, so to take into account the intersections, uh, the intersectionalism that uh, is uh, included, so uh, different capacities, and I think languages is also uh, a very Im important point that was not mentioned yet. I came a little late, so I don't know, but uh, I think this is really also a great uh, barrier, and uh, this is where community networks are also offer uh, or can, could offer, or doing the first step to uh, provide solutions on this. So I wish I had a whiteboard. Yeah, please. Go. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, I'm Patricia from Costa Rica, from the government of Costa Rica. Uh, I just want to share uh, a best practice that we have. Uh, uh, early this year, uh, the government announced that uh, we're going to have uh, Wi-Fi in more than 400 uh, uh, parks and public spaces and also libraries and schools all over the country. And, and this was funding uh, from a fund that we created basically from taxes from big providers. So there's this big fund that it was exclusively made to make internet accessible to everybody. And, and, and by the moment it's working fine, but also we have found challenges regarding mostly uh, digital literacy that uh, it's needed, especially for vulnerable groups uh, like uh, women and other people and sometimes young people. So I think that the thing about access it has also to do with uh, um, uh, uh, digital literacy. It's very important to consider that. And also the thing about uh, uh, have uh, access in different uh, languages and different kind of uh, the multilingual uh, access to the internet. Um, well, the government also has launched a, a, a public policy regarding access to, to make all the, all the um, government uh, websites to make them accessible to everybody and it has to be done uh, during the, la uh, the next three years. So uh, it, it can be also a more equitable uh, a way of seeing internet. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for sharing that, that illustration. Um, and so I think we're going to turn to Dulce, who um, during our introductory session uh, moderated the breakout group on access um, and infrastructure. And then, then we can um, move on to other topics. Dulce, please. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Paul, for giving me this opportunity. Um, again, my name is Dalsi Banyala. I'm from Vanuatu, if you know where Vanuatu is. And I'm, a, I'm the former regulator for telecommunications, and I can give you some insights on what's happening there. So, first of all, um, the issue here is, you know, that we have covered in the last uh, how many days uh, access, infrastructure, and affordability. But more of a there are more other factors included to that one that makes it more complicated. But in the Vanuatu example, we had this policy, what we call the universal access policy, and it promotes a model called pay or play. This is where the operators you know, are monitored by the regulator to make sure that they are actually implementing this policy. So, for example, if the operators are consulted and they feel that, no, we are choosing to play, then that's when they, you know, at their own cost, they develop access. But if they don't, then that's when we levy them. So it worked out very well, and in the last year, we achieved around 98% uh, of that 
population, not the geography, population coverage. But, but there needs to be a lot of improvement on quality of service. And that could be a second phase going forward, which they're currently working on it. Okay, the interesting part in there is that the regulator have the role to monitor the licenses. And in our case, there are some remote communities where we give these internet communities a special license we call exception license. This is where we, some of the levies, for example, some conditions, they are exempted from that. So it went out really well, and that's why we achieved that population coverage. So I think it depends very much on the, the policy itself, the government mandate, the overall uh, roadmap. And as if we have that really cleared at the national level, I'm pretty sure we can walk our way through, through the multi-stakeholder approach and to deliver the access. I also note from the, the people with special needs or the disability, this is also another tough area, but the policy also indicate that they must be included, and that's where the operators also have a function in there to you know, play work together with the government and work together with other interested stakeholders, especially the aid donors to support and provide access. So I'll close it there. Thanks so much, Dalsi. And we're lucky to have regulators in the room. It's a, it's a very valuable perspective. Um, so having started with these questions about um, infrastructure and then distinguishing access to infrastructure from accessibility um, to, to the internet, um, I just kind of want to come back to um, accessibility also being dependent um, on uh, content available in different languages and also digital skills. And so we're kind of building a, a theme here, and I'm, I'd like to turn to Rose, uh, who during our intro session led the breakout discussion on um, digital skills, innovation, and jobs. And then we might segue um, there, as the gentleman had mentioned languages, to the local content and uh, language discussion. But uh, Rose, please take the floor. Thank you, Susan, and good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Mary Rose. I'm from the Philippines, so I lead um, the discussion on digital skills, education, and jobs during the introductory session. So we've been hearing repetitively, like over and over again, how we can have meaningful and productive access to the internet. And so we're th talking about how can we prepare our workforce um, to respond to the digital demand and the fast-paced improvement and development in the technology so that we can have, indeed, a meaningful and productive access to the Internet. So one of the key messages that transpires um, over the course of the IG Forum and, um, and during the introductory session that we have is how can we prepare our educators and if, there's, if there are practices and ways or policies that we can prepare our educators for them to be able to transfer the needed skills to the students and to their graduates and even to the existing workforce to um, improve their skills based on the demand of the um, changing technologies. And I think what's the most important thing that arise here is building not just the digital skills, but also the analytical skills, critical skills, and the human skills, which is a lifelong learning. Um, and we need a, an approach in order to build this capacity instead of just giving them the skills on how to program, on how to code, and use the computer, right? So um, we also like, for example, in the Philippines, if I could share, um, there's a challenge on improving the university curriculum in order for us to advance our, um, our courses based on the demand of um, emerging technologies. So what we do is we don't have, like, while we are on the course of improving the curriculum, what we do is we partner with industry associations, with private companies, for them to give the training and workshops to our students instead of forcing our educators to do it internally. 
So, and that one is one of the best practices that I've heard as well, and I also I can share to you. Um, I think there's a, there is a necessary uh, bridging the gap between the, between the lack of capacity at the academic level and, and, the, and the expertise of the industry partners. And that's where I think we can start working on, on how we can improve the digital skills of our workforce. And also, I want to um, share to you if you have read this charter by the German government for the SMEs, uh, if you heard that report, I think um, coming from the private sector and uh, tech startup community builder, um, I want to highlight, and I think this is also a call by the German government to all the practitioners to share with these with this goals and aspirations. Um, it's here that we have to work together, the government and private sectors and civil society, to help our small and medium enterprise to be empowered and digitally skilled and give them the resources, whether it's infrastructure or, or financial resources, to help them invest in a more robust um, digital infrastructure, give them access to, to more resources to empower, to empower them and help them create and develop um, develop solutions instead of just um, instead of just you know doing this for other people. Like I mean, giving them the capacity to offer their 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 solutions at the local level and at the same time at the global level. So um, that one I wanna stress. I wanna stress out. So thank you, Susan. And maybe I can throw back to um, again to the room if you have heard. Um, within your participation on any workshops or sessions, if you can share any practices or policies that you've heard and maybe you can share to everyone as well. Thank you. Sorry, so it seems we have, we have a few hands over here. Um, would, uh, would you like to begin? Yes. So I have a question. Uh, uh, now I see that uh, the issue that I'm struggling back home, it's not just m issues in my country, but it's universal. Uh, uh, coming back to uh, the, the point uh, that have been raised by the colleague, uh, we currently have the same issue with back in, in Afghanistan where we are in the process of uh, uh, bringing in, uh, uh, restructuring or revising our university curriculums in the area of specifically in computer science section where how do we uh, incorporate the new technology trend that is happening, how do we do that as a curriculum. And the approach that uh, uh, she suggested is uh, we did consider that, but, but our concern is how do you institution, institutionalize the uh, trend for the curriculums uh, to be adoptive, uh, adoptive and somehow uh, changeable in terms of new technology development. Let's say, for instance, that currently we are talking about big data and Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and we are still struggling uh, in making that into our uh, curriculum. And the private sector is more looking into human capital, and they will be back relying on the universities. So it's a sort of like value chain, and, and, and uh, unless we do not introduce those sort of mechanism or, or uh, uh, approaches that could, uh, uh, let's say, enable the way for uh, uh, enhancing our curriculum. Has there been any, any positive, uh, any other approaches that could be supportive for us in making those windows open for innovation and for adoption of new technologies in our curriculum? Thank you. Do we have any educators in the room? Any educators? Yeah. Oh, sure, Rose, please. Okay. Um, thank you, sir. I understand it's yeah, it's really quite challenging to institutionalize that at the national level. So what we are really doing right now is starting a small step within our university. So within our university, we we institutionalize it at our level. 
So with our partnership with industry associations, it's just for us, it was a matter of memorandum of agreement that they can train the students and they can provide internship, they can provide um, opportunities for them to work with their companies and allow that to be credited to the student's um, um, diploma or course. Yeah, so we really start in the small steps because if we wait for the national government to institutionalize all this, then we'll take, you know, <laughs> you know the challenge. So we are doing on our best at our level. Uh, we are like a consortium of universities. So that's what we do at our own level. Um, hi, this is Carolina from LACNIC again. Um, I wanted to um, share another reflection from one of the workshops we organized. Um, I think there was only one workshop on the future of work at this year's IGF, um, and uh, Rose, I believe you, you were in attendance. Um, uh, and I think uh, two main messages came out from um, sort of uh, our work, sort of reflecting around the question of future of work, which I understand has to do with, you know, what do we want the internet for, right? Um, and uh, the two things that came up was, one was in, sort of in terms of how, prepare, how we should go about preparing the sort of workforce in the global south, uh, for the jobs of, of the future uh, was the question of upscaling um, uh, digital skills. Um, and I don't want to, uh, you know, say a lot more about that. I think uh, Rose did a great summary. I, get, I guess the big conclusion was that you don't just do digital skills. Digital skills has to come, you know, sort of hand in hand uh, with, you know, soft skills. And also specifically when you talk about sort of the workforce in the global south, not just thinking that the global south can, you know, like take in like a micro work and sort of replicate certain sort of, uh, you know, inequalities sort of in the digital world, but that, you know, you can also sort of work for uh, people in the global south to sort of um, evolve and, you know, maybe start with like, you know, some, some basic jobs, but like, you know, um, access, uh, you know, better work opportunities um, uh, as they develop, say, I don't know, careers in, in, in technology, uh, you know, they learn how to program and so forth, you know, that they can sort of, you know, better integrate and access better jobs in the digital economy. So that was one thing. And the other big thing that I haven't heard come up yet is the question of the gig economy and uh, questions around whether work opportunities that are becoming available and that are being thought of as a solution for unemployment in the global south, whether those are decent work opportunities. And we had quite sort of a, a lengthy discussion about how we can go about making the uh, gig economy uh, more fair for workers and, and sort of the need to sort of rethink um, sort of Perhaps, I don't know, like labor laws, but at the very least, like, you know, labor conditions for workers on the gig economy. I think those would be very important messages to include. Thank you. En cuanto a esta alianza que la señora de Filipinas hablaba entre la empresa privada y la universidad, tenemos que considerar que hay un riesgo donde sea la empresa privada la que maneje lo que enseñamos en la universidad. About, about this cooperation uh, that the colleague from the Philippines was mentioning, I think there's uh, some kind of a threat also that we have to be very careful that uh, the private sector will not end up to define the curriculum of the universities. Porque Si bien en Internet tenemos unas grandes oportunidades de trabajo, debemos saber también que el desarrollo no solo es el trabajo. Uh, it's true that uh, the Internet is uh, creating lots of uh, uh, opportunities, uh, but uh, it's not only uh, the, the labor market that, uh, that means development. Como desarrollador de software que soy, Sé que mi trabajo no solo tiene la oportunidad de generar un dinero para mi familia, sino también de transformar la realidad de la comunidad donde vivo. And so, uh, me as a, a software developer, I see my work not only as something that, uh, crea uh, that creates an, an income for me and my family, but also something that should transform the community where I'm living. Hay un riesgo adicional cuando quienes fabricamos el software o estamos en tecnología, 
caemos en el remolino de la precarización laboral. And uh, we have to be uh, really careful, uh, especially those uh, like me working with technology, that uh, we don't enter in uh, dynamics where we are uh, auto exploiting ourselves in precarious uh, uh, conditions. Y nos convertimos en conductores de Uber en el software, quitándonos eh, la posibilidad de desarrollar realmente trabajos que nos transformen como personas y como sociedad. Esto eh, es algo que la empresa privada no entiende, porque ellos necesitan es obreros. So uh, I don't would like to end up as a, a kind of Uber driver of uh, software development. Uh, we also always have to think how to create uh, a just and uh, dignifying uh, working conditions that transform our societies. Well, thank you. I mean, um, for raising these 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 other concerns or, or points for consideration. Um, on the on uh, digital skills and education and innovation, do we have? Oh, please. I, yeah. I would briefly like to comment on what the sir, what the minister was saying. So the, uh, that sounds like uh, that the key word is mobility, mobility, and digital uh, work jobs. Uh, I would well. I'm already speaking, so uh, I'm also a software developer. And regarding accessibility, I'm ashamed to admit here that I don't I don't produce uh, inclusive software, right? Uh, so it's not accessible. And I would like to ask anyone here if they know how how can we push the industry to. Uh, to for to pay the costs, pay the higher development costs to make software more easier to use, to allow more people to have better jobs, and that's it. Philip Okwinski speaking. Thank you. I think these are very very important questions, and I'm glad that you've asked them. Um, would anybody like to, it's a big question, but <laughs> would anybody like to um, take the floor and uh, suggest some ideas? Well, I mean, because it's such an important question, I think that means that we all need some time to, to consider it. Um, but thank you so much for, for asking these questions. Um, so, so we have really gone through quite the journey here. Um, again, so we started with access to infrastructure issues. Um, we discussed community networks as a way to connect the unconnected. And um, we've talked about accessibility. Um, we've talked about the aspect of accessibility, which is digital skills. Um, and then we've also taken a look at inclusion from the SME perspective, how do you include in the private sector different types, different sizes of businesses? Um, so I'd like to, and since we had our last two interventions from software developers, um, I'd like to move on to uh, local content and um, multilingualism. And the reason why I connect that with software developers is I will share one issue that um, that could be kind of obscure uh, for most folks, but it's called universal acceptance. And universal acceptance, I think, is an aspect of um, digital inclusion. So what universal acceptance means is that um, all domain names or email addresses, regardless of what script they're in or how long the domain string is, um, are accepted by software. So if we think about, I'll just take um, one half of universal acceptance. Uh, if you have an email um, address that ends in a new GTLD, for example, like dot photography, 
Uh, if you go and you want to use a web form or sign up for a listserv, you're able to use that email address and it is recognized. There is also a really important um, multilingualism um, and digital inclusion aspect to universal acceptance, and that is the acceptance of internationalized domain names. Or say, for example, if um, you have a, an email or domain name address in the Armenian script, and you'd like to be, ac be able to um, sign up for access different um, services using that domain name, that you'd be able to do that. And so for, for many folks, and I'll have to admit, I, I speak French and English, and that's, that's about it. I'm not familiar with um, different scripts other than Latin. But for the great many of um, you know, inter internet end users who do use different scripts, it is, it is about lowering a, a barrier to be able to participate um, more seamlessly um, on the internet using your own language. And so I just wanted to bring that up just in case folks hadn't heard about universal acceptance readiness. Um, but when it comes to uh, the question of local content and multilingualism, um, I'm sure you know we have we, we have a very diverse crowd here today, and I'd like to um, hear from folks if they have any thoughts or experiences to share. If anybody was able to attend a session on this sub theme of digital inclusion. Any local content stories from the IGF this year? No? Okay, well, um, hey. perhaps, <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, okay, we've got two. Um, first, we'll, we'll, we'll start over here and then go to you. Thank you. Um, el contenido local, Quizá responde a la pregunta que hice inicialmente de la red para qué. Es lo que hemos pensado en nuestra red, o red es el, el nombre. Maybe the, the question of local content answers a little bit the, the question that I raised earlier, what do we use the internet for? And so the project that I work, it's called Nuestra Red, Our Red, or Network. Our network. Eh, Pero eh, antes de estar en el IGF tenía un concepto un poco pobre sobre la importancia real del contenido local. Uh, before coming to the IGF, I had a very poor uh, or somehow poor understanding of uh, what uh, local content really means. Uh -huh. um, Ayer, fue estando en, en, en un evento sobre contenido local, vimos unas experiencias muy, muy grandes y muy importantes sobre contenido local que realmente me han estimulado. Yesterday we were at a panel uh, where experiences were uh, exchanged about the production of, uh, of local content that really impressed me. Como la experiencia en Sudáfrica, de hacer un estudio de animación digital con niñas que no solo cuentan las historias de las niñas convirtiéndolas en superhéroes, sino que eh, las han capacitado para que ellas mismas hagan la parte de la animación digital e inclusive los guiones. So there was, for instance, this uh, uh, animation film production studio in uh, South Africa, and they were not only uh, uh, producing uh, films with uh, girl characters, superhero characters, but they also included uh, young uh, girls and, and women as active uh, producers of those uh, films. Y lo más importante o lo más impactante mejor es que ellos tienen la certeza que un día ganarán un premio de la Academia, un premio Oscar, y yo creo que así va a ser. And the most important was that they really have lots of confidence to uh, win uh, the Academy Awards uh, one day, and I think this will really happen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, and local content can, if you encounter that term for the first time, it can be confusing. And sometimes it's used in different contexts. For example, in, 
and um, trade agreements or trade requirements. There could um, be provisions around local content that might not just mean internet content, but, um, um, but physical um, goods. But I think mainly in the IGF context, when we talk about local content, it is um, content that is well, <laughs> made locally and available locally, of course. Um, but the idea is is that if folks have content that is more relevant to them and in their language, then you know some say that will help drive uh, demand for internet access and um, therefore increase uptake. Um, but I, I uh, hope if anybody else would like to um, jump in on that definition, I, I would feel very grateful if they would. But f um, first, we'll, we'll go to you and then uh, Rose. <clears throat> no, just was thinking one could perhaps tie a couple of points here together. Philippe was asking, how do you get software developers and industry to provide the more accessible technologies? And I think the answer is in part market forces won't deliver it. So that's why you need rules, you need regulations, you need governance. And I take that over to the IDNs, the internationalized domain names. Those were not going to be provided unless there was a push from rules. Uh, but it's also a case that before the IDNs, the internationalized domain names were pushed through finally in ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers in 2009. It took a huge push, and you'd say it's obvious. Most people don't work in Latin script, so obviously you need to have internationalized domain names. So it seems obvious, so why was it such a long struggle to get that through? Well, there were long, I would say a good part of it is because the governance itself was not inclusive. So since most of the governance was being done by the large businesses, by the large governments, by the English language speakers, etc., there wasn't enough push. Anyway, it's just a general push to say inclusion in, go in governance is so important because if you don't have inclusion in governance, you don't get the inclusive rules and then you don't get the inclusive digital society. Thank you for bringing, bringing that back full circle <laughs> in the governance team. Um, uh, so swinging back again to, the, uh, to local content, Rose. Yeah. I totally agree and I think that's the one that, that's I want to say as well, I think there's a need for, to push for the principles of universal acceptance. And it's a way to go to um, encourage and build the capacity of our software developers and the website owners to adopt uh, the system of universal acceptance. Because if, if they're not doing that, then I think it should start from there, like the awareness that there is this principle of universal acceptance and why do we need to, to adopt this principle? you know, to make our internet more inclusive. Can I just get a show of hands? Um, who here has an email address or a domain name in a non-ASCII script? Does anybody have an email address or domain name in a script that is not in? Okay, here we go. And, and what script is that? Oh. It's Latin with some... Uh, uh, digraph characters. Okay, um, and, and that is that certainly counts. I'm sorry, is it where are you from? May I ask? I'm from Croatia. 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 Okay, Croatia. Um, anybody else have so everybody else's emails here are in Latin or ASCII? Okay, that's interesting. Really? No? Huh? Okay, well, universal acceptance is definitely at its nascent stage, but we hope it will become uh, more, more important and um, prevalent and visible as an issue as time goes on. So we've had some really interesting comments on um, local content. Yes, please. Eh, el tema de los de por qué no tenemos un email con scripts o con caracteres no ASCII. It's about the question uh, why we don't have uh, so, uh, more emails with uh, ASCII scripts. Es precisamente por el problema de la aceptancia, o sea, no es que eh, tomemos 
eh, la elección, sino es una obligación porque no nos queremos arriesgar a que nuestros emails o nombres de dominio no sean compatibles con lo que está aceptado globalmente. I think the answer is the acceptance or the, the fear of not being accepted uh, using a different kind of, uh, of email address. Uh, and so uh, uh, we are just uh, trying to, to follow the, uh, the general uh, rules. It can become kind of a chicken and egg situation, I guess. Um, and I, it's, there is that question about demand, but then there is also... Um, the ability to be able to <laughs> first to cater and to accept these non-ASCII domain names and that um, at the working level resides with software developers but there is a whole host of um, other um, roles at play um, when it comes to policies, even procurement policies, if you, you can um, create a, a, a demand in so many words, you can create a demand there through procurement policy. And thank you for that insight. Um, so we are rounding up our session, and I would just like to um, turn to Juliana, um, who led our social inclusion breakout. So this will be the final sub-theme of um, the inclusion discussion, social inclusion. Hello, uh, my name is Juliana. I'm from Indonesia and also a Mac member. Since the time is running out, I will be short and briefly uh, talking about the social inclusion uh, that we discussed that I lead to breakout. Uh, I think is for my opinion on another social inclusion is an impact that follow the development of technical part of technology. The community network, uh, uh, the, there is a learning from coding and deployment computer hardware for students in both rural and in both rural area or in city. Uh, this kind of deployment is bring the both negative and positive impact at the, uh, uh, how people call uh, how in the community. Um, the negative impact is the bring the, our dis discussion, discussion is about young people who will expose with the pornography, violence, or hate speech. Uh, it also raised the problem about digital gender gap and the, secu uh, the security of transgender sex worker, sex drug user when they connecting into digital world. But also there is positive way about the deployment of technology when when more people getting connected, uh, especially people in living in uh, a rural area who difficult to get to access. Um, there is a discussion how to tackle the negative effect of technology. Community empowerment and government regulation are some idea that rise. We, we and I and and. Me and some people still believe that technology could bring advantages and positive way in, into people, but we still have to think how to mitigate the negative effect of technology. Okay, we, we just want to open the floor for a minute or two on social inclusion, and it's quite a key issue to digital inclusion. Yes. Hi. Um, well, I'm really happy to hear this. I couldn't make the initial session. I'm happy to hear uh, social inclusion come up. My session was that thus far this session was had been sort of gender blind a little bit, and I think social inclusion, um, you know, goes to speak about some of the challenges of, um, you know, LGBTQI communities, you know, uh, experience in terms of exercising exercising their sort of digital rights in the online world. Um, this is a topic that I'm interested in. I haven't actually coordinated any workshops around it, um, but I think that uh, gender needs to be somewhat transversal to any talks about digital inclusion. Uh, it didn't come up when we spoke about access, accessibility, or um, even local content, and I think it's really something that you know sort of goes through all these topics that, that we discussed today. 
Um, and um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just sort of leave that sort of comment or feedback there. Thank you. Okay, are, th are there any other comments or interventions from the floor? Uh, anything anyone wants to say on any topic? Any advice you want to give us? Yeah, yes. I, w I have something else, if I may, Thank you. if no yes. one else. Um, I wanted to give a bit of feedback about the session itself. I think um, this is my fifth IGF. I'm really excited to see that we're doing these sessions to sort of... First, you focused on three topics this year, uh, and then you had these opening sessions and these closing sessions. I um, feel like there's been so much sort of wealth of and, and depth of discussions, and I'm not sure if that came through in, in, in this session. I'm thinking that perhaps, it, you know, while it's a very, very important space, there's something that can be done for, uh, you know, to ensure at least workshop organizers are required to come to these sessions. Um, because, you know, I've done my best trying, for instance, to like explain some of the conclusions from the community networks, uh, you know, uh, sessions that I participate in, participated in, and I, f I feel like I didn't do it justice <laughs> again. Um, and um, so perhaps that can be a way in which we can really sort of draw the conclusions because I feel like, I don't know, say around content, there's, there's a lot of things that went on that maybe we didn't manage to sort of touch upon here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that feedback. And um, we did uh, we did send out invites, kind of explaining the nature of. I don't know if everybody received them. Perhaps we could do better to communicate that. But inviting workshop organizers um, and participants to come and share. But um, this is there's definitely room for improvement. And I, I agree with you. I feel like there is such a wealth of. Um, knowledge and experience, and if we can do our best to evoke that, uh, then we'll focus on this for next time. Yes. Yeah, just to, sorry, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm, I'm Jan Scholt at the University of Gothenburg and University of Duisburg, Essen, in Sweden and Germany. Um, I just want to follow up on that. I think that that's a really good point. We were trying to, we were struggling a little bit at the opening of the session. How do we get this going? And possibly a way to get it going is indeed to ask the, the workshop organizers to come with one message, you know, and then just go around and, and tell them that they're going to have a role. Because I was a workshop organizer, I thought, yes, I want to hear what was coming here. But I probably would have been the more inclined to come if I knew that I actually was supposed to do something here. Um, that might be an idea. Yeah, uh, on behalf of the MAG, I would actually like to thank the two of you specifically for those interventions because. It is very important for us. Just so everyone knows, this is the first time that uh, the IGF has taken this approach. Uh, so in a way, it was a bit of an experiment, and you know we want to be risque. <laughs> but you know, our sense was that this is bringing some focus. You know, the IGF has been accused of becoming unfocused, and there's, if you look at last year, there's just thousands of things happening all over the place. So we tried to get three main themes plus all the other open forums, DCs, and main sessions. And there's still probably too much. But our sense is to, to, to take stock of these three tracks and get an understanding, did they make a difference to people's experience uh, at the IGF? And if we do it again, which I hope we will, uh, how do we do it better? And the comments that we received, I think, we will, well, we will definitely take them back. And we're hoping that they, they will become part of the way that we tackle this next year. And to be honest, when we started this session, we, we, we had a bit more of a formal structure, but I don't think we had the right structure. And that's why we pulled away from it. You know, going back to breakout groups, I don't think was the right approach because that would not have got an open discussion and open feedback from each of the, uh, the workshop, all the workshop streams. But I, think, I, think it, I don't know how we can get more uh, organizers to these sessions because, you know, we can't force people to come. It's on a voluntary basis. So it needs to add value to them. And at these sessions, there's still a lot of interesting things going on around us. So you know, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone that did take their time out of other sessions to come here, because this discussion for us has been very useful. I'm hoping it's been useful for all of you, and that it was worth your time joining us at this session. And I, I think we can just have a clap for everybody that came and ourselves. And thank you. 
and on that note, we close this session, and hopefully we'll see you in the afternoon for the closing, closing sessions. <laughs>